Hey everyone, thanks for joining me again for our networking session between education professionals and uh, instructional designers. My name is Sharon Chaden Glass. I'm so very happy that you guys are here today. This is kind of becoming a highlight of my month. We've been doing this since August and now it's kind of cool because we're actually like seeing people like get jobs and they come back and like talk about their jobs. So it's, it's super exciting to me and very rewarding. So um, today we have, uh, we were going to have five speakers, but when um, Kate from um, University of Miami was unable to come, um, so we still have four speakers. And um, the order that we're going in today, um, let me say their names. So first will be Jenny Davis, who is my colleague from Sinclair Community College. After that will be Lane Istvan, or Laney, I'm sorry, Laney Istvan. And then after that will be Jeanette's is it Skaggs, Jeanette? Yes, Skaggs. Okay. And finally, Elizabeth Huber. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Jenny. And Hi, Jenny, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're all yours. Hi, everybody. Um, as Sharon said, my name is Jenny Davis, and I am a senior instructional designer and the quality assurance coordinator at Sinclair College in Dayton, Ohio. So good evening from Ohio, everybody. Um, my journey to this really started, oh gosh, many decades ago, I'm aging myself here, but I came into education kind of through the back door. Uh, I did my undergrad in history with plans to go to law school, and then that kind of fell through because I decided I could not fight for something I didn't believe in. So then I was going to go and get my PhD in history, but Life again turned and I ended up not going down that path, but I always knew I wanted to be involved in education in some fashion and involved in that world in some fashion. So my first actual teaching job, I was asked to come back to my alma mater and I taught Western Civ and US history for a couple of years, but I didn't have the PhD and so I was basically let go. <laughs> and I knew, again, I wanted to be involved in education in some fashion, and I got a job for our local literacy council, and I was their curriculum director. So I was involved with not only the adult education students, but also we had family literacy programs, and we had a pretty large contingency of what at the time was ESL, now ESOL. I kind of went through that transition during my time there. So I moved up from being the curriculum director into the director of education. So I oversaw all of those programs. So I did a lot of writing of curriculum, write a lot of lesson writing. Um, I also got involved with doing professional development for all of our volunteers, as well as adult education teachers. And that led into a position with the state doing professional development across the state for all of the higher education and adult education teachers. So I was doing a lot of training of teachers. But like anything else, funding changes, and so you have to adapt. And so that's when I kind of looked at my skill set. I had been doing education, I had been doing curriculum development, I've been doing all of these large project management type of tasks, but I didn't have my degree. And so I started shopping around for a degree went back and actually got my master's in education in instructional design, and then started looking for a position. And I was fortunate that one came open at Sinclair and it was like, I'm gonna see what happens with it. Um, and so that grew into being an instructional designer and then getting involved with projects um, and different initiatives that we have. And then I found Quality Matters, which is our QA tool, and I got very involved with that. So I have a number of uh, roles and certifications through them, and that has led to other projects. So I think it's something where a lot of doors open if you can share your skill set with people and take into account all the things that you do and how that can fit into creating and designing things for other people as well. So that's kind of my story, but I look forward to your questions later on. So next in line. Thank you, Jenny. All right, so the next up is Lainey. Alrighty. Hey everybody, my name is Lainey Istvan and I'm really happy to be here tonight and look forward to meeting some of you in the breakout rooms. I am from 
Spring Hill, Florida. It is about 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes north of Tampa. So um, it's very uh, warm <laughs> here. It's probably uh, 80 degrees, 85 degrees. We took a trip to North Carolina this weekend and it was beautiful. And then we came home and it was humid and, and warm. So any of you that are up north, I'm a little jealous. So I'm gonna tell you how I got into instructional design. I am a teacher, a former teacher. When I went to college, I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do. I thought that I wanted to be a teacher and I had a professor who really liked my creative writing skills and she asked me what I wanted to do and I told her I wanted to be a teacher and she was like, no. I really see you more in marketing. I see you, you know, doing more creative writing, things like that. So I was young and impressionable. So I took her advice and decided I was going to get my degree in organizational communication. I felt like it kind of tied, you know, the corporate world and communication and, you know, wasn't really too focused, but it was broad enough that I could kind of explore with what I wanted to do. So I ended up in sales and I ended up being good at it, but I didn't love it. And I regretted not going into teaching. So I also kind of went around the back door to get into teaching and I um, certified alternatively. So my first year teaching, I worked in a Title I school and I worked, um, I taught kindergartners and I loved it. I loved teaching kindergarten. I taught that for about five years. Then I became a mom and I had children of my own. And then I felt like I was mom at home and I was mom at school. So I um, decided I need to move up. So I taught second grade for a couple of years and my kids got older, so I needed to go up again. <laughs> so I uh, ended up in middle school, teaching middle school. Then I switched schools in the county. I, I went to a magnet school and I taught gifted, fifth grade, third grade and middle school history. And um, love teaching the gifted students. You can have some great conversations with them. They think way outside the box, but um, loved kids, but I didn't love what education was turning into. And it was definitely very emotionally draining for me. So I felt like I wanted to be a, a better mom and I wanted to put my creative skills to use better than what I was doing in the classroom. I loved putting together materials and ways for students to learn and explore in ways that was interesting for them and motivating and engaging because a lot of times, you know, students just kind of sit there and do a workbook and that wasn't what I wanted them to do. I wanted them to have fun while they were learning. And so I found that I kind of enjoyed that aspect more than the actual delivery of the lesson. So I knew I didn't want to go into ed leadership. A lot of teachers, that's their step. They move into ed leadership and I knew that that wasn't for me. So at my school, um, that I went to St. Leo, they came in and they spoke to teachers and said, hey, these are the programs that we have. And, you know, she told me about instructional design. I said, what's that? That sounds really good. That sounds like something I would, <laughs> I would really like. Um, and so here I am. So I taught for 15 years and I was terrified to leave the classroom, but I wanted it really bad <laughs> and I made the jump. So here I am. So thank you, Sharon, for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, let's see, I may have lost myself. Jeanette, are you next? Okay. Yep. All right, awesome, I gotcha. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I think we're good. Well, um, I don't think for she just a brief, just a brief second. I, so this is real life. Um, I live in a household where I have adult children. I have uh, twins that are 23 and I have a 14 year old son. And for a brief second, I had to make sure that it was not any of my children bleeding in, even though I have the headphones on, I had to make sure it wasn't them. So I got it. You guys are good. It's yeah, fine. I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> so having said that, um, the, the, the two children, the, the, the adult children are really part of the, the 
the journey to where I am. Um, I always wanted to be a teacher. And from sixth grade, um, I remember sitting in my English class in sixth grade and I got in trouble with the teacher and the teacher goes, um, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an English teacher. And she says, then why aren't you paying attention? I'm like, because I already know all this. Bad thing to say to a teacher, let's just, mm, there. But I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I knew I wanted to be an English teacher. So that's what I did. I went to college. I got an English degree. Somewhere in there, um, I married a man who was in the military, which meant that we were going to travel. And we ended up with states, we ended up in states that um, the first one did not need an English teacher that was not fluent in Spanish as well. So um, I couldn't get a teaching job. So I, I worked in an architectural and engineering firm and loved corporate life. Just um, the whole idea of business and the different, the different departments that are in a corporate environment really drew my interest. So um, eventually we did get to where we needed, um, where we were out of the military. The twins were born. Um, we moved back to Tennessee. I decided, okay, well, let's, let's see if we can actually get a teaching degree. So our, our teaching job. So I went and I taught at a, a school for um, five years and the girls were in school. And when they were in first grade, the first grade teachers were like, you know, we're having some problems. Um, they're, um, they're just not as mature as the other kids in their class. And the girls were uh, probably the youngest in their class. Their birthdays are July. It was one of those um, edge of the year kind of things. And um, I said, well, you know what? I think we're just going to home. We're gonna home educate next year. So um, I quit and uh, I brought the girls home. And so I've, I home educated for 11 years. I home educated them from second grade all the way until they graduated high school. In that time period, I also had another kid. So I have a 14 year old son who is now in high school. Um, but the plans were always going to be when the girls graduated from high school and went on to college, Timothy would go back into public school, private school, whatever was um, around, and he ended up in the, the public school system. So um, we have 11, year, 11 years here where what I was doing is what instructional designers do, right? I took the information that needed to go to my children, and I created those learning experiences and presented it to my children. When Timothy went back to school, I found out that I had time and I probably should go and get a job. And there was um, a job opening for a family support liaison with the virtual academy that was here in North Carolina. And um, that's a, ch it's a charter school. Um, they liked the fact that I had been in the classroom. They liked the fact that I had been a homeschool mom. They also liked the fact that my preference was really high school. I um, really like that age group. I understand the way they think, which is scary. Um, but anyway, I went and I worked for um, North Carolina Virtual Academy for two years. And while I was there, I got to thinking about the education of not just the students, but also the education of the teachers and the staff and even the parents. And I got into discussions with my husband and some of his friends about professional development outside of teachers, right? Teachers were, were geared toward, okay, today's Monday, we're going to have professional development this afternoon. You know, you have to stay around for your PD. Um, but what happens outside of the education education department? What happens outside of a school to professionals that need professional development? Okay, so that was the next thing. I thought, you know, I really want to go back into corporate. I want to make this, ch this, this change to helping others become lifelong learners. If that is what I think, then I really, if I think that the children are going to benefit from their parents being lifelong learners, then I need to be in the situation of helping the parents be lifelong learners, okay? So I am now part of sales enablement at Progress Software, 
And if you're wondering what sales enablement is, sales enablement is the department that comes in and takes the marketing information on a product and the product information from product managers and imagine a fire hose to a sprinkler and gives it and teaches it to the sales reps. Okay, so this, this concept of being a, um, a lifelong learner, trying to get other people to be a lifelong learner, and you bring in the instructional design on top of it. Because if you don't create those learning experiences for those sales reps, they're not going to learn. They're not going to be able to utilize the information from marketing. They're not going to be able to utilize the information from product, uh, from product management as well. So the instructional design gave me the structure to build those learning experiences and and use the all the other stuff that i had learned even before that now when you think about instructional design most people think okay you've got id after your name right you got instructional design after your name well i don't i have sales enablement after my name but i do have the degree um, there's another part to this, which is called uh, imposter syndrome. And if you guys don't know what imposter syndrome is, I would suggest that you definitely look it up because you've either had it and didn't know it, or you have it currently, or you will have it eventually, especially with instructional design. Um, I, about six months into having, <laughs> yes, Leslie, we got degrees together. Um, about six months into sales enablement, I realized, um, I know very little about sales. Um, and I did go through a very stiff set of, of imposter syndrome, which sent me looking for the master's degree program that Leslie and I went through um, to get the instructional design degree. And I would say, um, when people go, oh, great, you finished your degree. I was like, yes, I finally decided what I wanted to be when I grew up. So. There you go. And that's my story. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, okay, so our last person is Elizabeth, right? You ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. All right. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Huber, I'm located uh, in Utah. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in English teaching in 2016. Um, I was in the classroom for four years before I decided to move into instructional design. Um, kind of my journey, my first couple of years of teaching, uh, I was working in a Title I um, really high need school with uh, 40 plus kids right in a, in a class per period. Um, and it was overwhelming and it was a lot and I was excellent at it. Uh, and that's the unfortunate part of it is that I was a really good teacher and just wanted something else from life. Um, and I didn't want to be up late at night worrying about these kids and where they were and what they were doing and if they got this job or whatever was going on with their home life. I just couldn't handle that part anymore. Um, so then in um, January of 2019, so I, I ended up uh, my first couple of years of teaching getting really into ed tech and becoming a Google certified educator and learning all about the ed tech world. And I was really excellent at that and started to uh, lead trainings for my um, school and department and district and um, had a really good time doing that and thought if there was only something that I could be doing this kind of ed tech stuff all the time. Um, and my district had some ed tech type positions um, that I applied for and didn't end up getting. Uh, and I thought I, I do want to do this, but I also don't know if I want to be doing this in the K-12 environment. So what else is there? Right, so uh, then I saw, um, I looked into like doing an ed tech um, master's program and on the same website, there was this kind of instructional design program that was right next to it. And I looked at it and thought, okay, this is my way out of education. Um, this is what I can do uh, to kind of make my escape, right? So then um, I, January of 2019, I saw a job listing for an instructional designer position that is uh, super close to my house. And I don't live in an area that has a lot of instructional design jobs. So I ended up applying to this position. Um, I didn't get it because I couldn't speak the speak. I looked at the job and I thought, I have these skills and I am totally capable of doing this. But when it came down to the interview, I, I couldn't talk the talk, right? So I thought, I, 
need to educate myself. I need to, to do some things uh, to improve my skills and show that I'm capable. Um, so then I ended up applying to a master's program and starting that a few months later. Um, and so most of the end of 2019 to May of 2020, um, I was teaching, I was in a master's program, um, and then COVID happened. And I thought, I do not want to go back into the classroom if this is what it's going to be like. Um, whether it's online or in person, I don't want to have to make that choice for me and my family. Um, and I did, I did a bunch of uh, contract work over the summer um, and starting kind of in May. Um, and kind of got into the, I don't know, the contract world and kind of seeing what else is out there and the different options that are available. Um, and realized that contract work is really hard to sustain, right? Uh, even with the 30% going like 30, 35% to taxes, it's, um, you're constantly having to find new work and, uh, right, be your own, um, I don't know, financial tracker and do these, all these other tasks that went with it. And I was not interested in doing that. Um, so end of August, I, uh, two weeks before school started, I called my principal and I said, I'm so sorry. I kind of thought that um, something would change and that we would not be going back to full in person with no, uh, you know, nothing, nothing different. And this is not the environment I want. And he said, Liz, I will do my best to keep you. What can I do? I'll hire someone to be in your classroom while you work from home. And I was like, I, that's an offer that I can't accept knowing that I don't, I don't want to be doing this all year, right? I want, I want out and I'm going to take my out. I'm done. Right. Um, so I uh, spent September and October doing some contract jobs um, and along the way interviewing. And for the last, um, let's see, I guess it's been four weeks now. Um, I have been uh, employed uh, fully at a, uh, as an instructional design technical writer at a company here in Utah. Um, so that's kind of my story and my quick sprint from right being a teacher to doing instructional design and uh, Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Leslie, I know from uh, Design by Humanity and I feel like that organization um, helped me see a lot of I guess the potential of remote work, but also um, Contract and the, like kind of the contract world and making connections was definitely key in my journey. So And I just um so I just put that designed by humanity into the chat. So if anyone wanted to look that up, um, super cool group. Um, actually, does anybody want to, who's, who's in designed by humanity, does anyone want to take a minute and explain what it is? Leslie. <laughs> I might, it might be you, Leslie, or it might be Elizabeth. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Designed by Humanity is a volunteer collective of instructional designers and, and other people, not just instructional designers, there's graphic designers, there's marketers, there's all different um, supplementary people. Um, and essentially the mission of Design by Humanity, it came out of immediately after the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis, um, the founders, uh, Tommy Seelock and Nyla Spooner, um, wanted to do something to address the, um, you know, sort of the systemic racism in our culture. So essentially, the the collective is at this point. Um, there's a twofold mission. We're trying to develop learning products that uh, address anti racism education, diversity, equity, and inclusion education, and also mentor and develop um, instructional designers specifically focusing on BIPOC um, people or women of color. So that's kind of the twofold mission. So uh, that started in June and we're still going, you know, there's lots of different teams developing lots of different learning products around those topics. So cool. it's all volunteer. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for a uh, whole group Q&A. So if you feel like you have a question and you really want to know the answer to it, now is the time. Um, you can just unmute yourself and talk, and I'll find you and I'll spotlight you. I'm happy to ask 
my question that yeah, I asked sure. in our group. Yeah. Go so ahead. I um, have been in the higher education space for about um, almost 12 years now. I'm in kind of an extracurricular position. So I feel like it's kind of it's straddling the line. I'm not um, the instructional designer that you would normally see at the higher education institution. It, the focus is more on um, out of class learning. Um, and I'm looking to pivot into corporate learning, but I'm feeling this very big hurdle of um, I only have higher education on my resume. So I feel like there's kind of um, a big hurdle in getting people in getting corporate environments to kind of see my background and see that it's um, worthwhile. Like I was literally just heard back from an interview that I did that um, they were just afraid that uh, they, they didn't have the time to mentor me to be able to adapt to the corporate learner audience. Um, and so just trying to really be able to market my skills as relevant. Like I feel like I am speaking the speak at least a little bit. Um, I do have an instructional design certificate, um, but just really getting perspectives on how you can kind of make that experience seem relevant and seem like it's not so much of a stretch and um, that you can adapt to the different audience, any kind of perspectives of being able to convince corporate audiences that this background is uh, worthwhile. Yeah, I, I would say like it's all about the bottom line. Um, so if you can prove how you're going to save them time or save them money, right? That's when they talk about the corporate world. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about like we're going to have uh, deadlines and we're gonna, you know, it's, it's all about time and money in the end. And in higher education, it's from my experience, when I did contract work with higher education, it's not about either of those things, right? It's about the student and learner and the college's perceived value, uh, but not about how are we going to save money and do the most we can with the limited time that we can. So mm -hmm. that's a good point. Um, I would also say that if you do have a portfolio that and you take the time to show to develop some samples for a hypothetical corporate situation, um, once you show that you can use something like storyline or things that are used in the corporate world, um, then that hurdle is a lot lower because once they see your portfolio, they're going to already know, oh, I don't have to mentor this person a ton to get them to understand the look and feel of what we what we will need in a corporate setting so yeah that's a good point i think someone wrote a question in the in the messages ah okay do you have any suggestions about creating a portfolio for someone who has um created a lot of online courses for work but not something that is shareable Mm, well, I mean, you definitely want your portfolio to be shareable because that's going to be how they actually see it. Um, for someone who's, can you make Sorry. a screen capture? I asked that question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's just, I've created a lot of online courses for like the higher ed environment for various jobs. Um, but like I've, created courses within like learning management systems. Right. So. Okay. I got you. So, um, what I did was I made screen captures. So like, I wanted to show that I could make an online or flipped. Actually what I did was flip learning. And so I went into my LMS and I made a screen capture and kind of did a tour through what I've already created to show them how, oh, see, I know what I'm doing. Like, look, there's objectives, there's content, there's assessment, you know, just to kind of show them that I understood how that could translate into a digital space. Does that, does that answer your question? Was it Katrina? Yeah, sorry. Um, no, I have um, my camera off, you can't see me. Yeah, I didn't even think about doing that within an LMS, like just doing, capturing the screen and yeah. showing them like, Oh yeah, I can make this. Um, I figured it would have to be with some sort of um, like software for for um, instructional design. No, you can just you can totally just use um, 
just, and if you don't have screen capture software, you can use something free like a Google, the Google plugin Loom, L-O-O-M, is, okay. a, is a free screen capture plugin that you can add to Chrome and you can just capture your screen like that. Okay, cool. So another idea beyond that is if you have a faculty member that you've worked with to create those, those courses um, that you have a good relationship with, ask them if they'll be a reference for you. Oh, good idea. And then well, I was those. the teacher in this classes. So, okay. <laughs> but, but the idea, yeah, idea yeah, if you can show how then you work good. with someone and translate what they, their vision for the course and translate that into your LMS and then have that screen capture to go with it, that can be an added benefit to this too. Yeah, okay. and Elizabeth is saying in the chat that um, screen, screen castify screen, uh, screenomatic. Is that a name? I've heard of that one yet. <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all free um, softwares that you can use to do screen capture. Mm -hmm. Do do we know what we mean by screen capture? It just means recording your computer screen, what you're doing on it. I didn't know what that word meant a couple years ago, and now everyone <laughs> is using it. So, um, other questions out there? I have a question. Yeah. So um, it seems like um, quite a few of you went back to school for um, a master's in instructional design or a graduate certificate. Um, has anybody um, who, who already has a master's in education, right? Like so maybe, you know, K through 12 education or, or I have a MAT. So did anybody make this transition without going back to school? Like, for example, you know, I've looked at some of the programs and I'm like, oh, I've already written these essays. And then also, you know, with the technology, um, I, I got um, Articulate Storyline and I taught myself how to use it using LinkedIn Learning, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, but do, but yes, um, do I really need to go back and get like a graduate certificate or another master's or can I make this transition without doing that? I love watching the gallery view because there's so many people that are just shaking their heads like, no, you don't. Does anyone want to um, respond to that? I think the name of the game is is making sure that when you're reading through a, a job a, a job rack or you're looking at a specific company even is to understand the transferable skills that you already have. I was telling my breakout room I actually had this list of transferable skills checklists that I got from University of Toledo and understanding the fact that what you're doing now already translates into what they're looking for. You just have to figure out where it plugs in. So it, you know, even if it's, even if it's a job that you're not going to, to apply to, okay, doesn't matter. Pull one down, walk through it, figure out where what you do currently already fits into it. And you're going to find that, that if you've already got the masters, they're not really going to look any further. Um, like I said, with, with my master's, I, going through the edX program and getting that micro master's thing first, it was nice because it sort of, it, it confirmed that this was really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But getting the full master's was really the, the backside of having that panic attack with the, with the, um, uh, the imposter syndrome, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world, but I didn't already have a master's, right? You already have one. They're not going to look any further for a degree, probably for anybody that you're working with. Um, but yeah, understanding those transferable, those transferable skills and knowing how to put them into the language that the person on the other end that's hiring is going to understand. And, and it, it just comes down to taking one that's already there and just going through it. Who, does anyone else have questions? I was just going to say that I've, I know a couple of people who have master's in education or ed tech or something like that and did not get um, a master's degree in instructional design or anything. And they also have been able to transition and recently find jobs. Erica Zimmer being one of them. But um, so, yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Other questions? If not, we can all go to bed. I love bed. It's my favorite. It's my favorite place in the house. <laughs> There's no kids in it. All right. Um, 
Thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, I'm going to put the feedback form in the chat um, for you to let me know what you think if you want to keep in touch. Um, the next one of these sessions is going to be um, December 11th, if you want to mark your calendars. And it's that's actually a Friday. It's a little bit different. Um, and it's going to be from 3 to 4 p.m. And um, I would love to have you for it. So as soon as I have the registration link available, um, I will post it on LinkedIn. Um, I'll also email it to you if you've registered and your email's on this. Um, I'll email it to you as well in case you want to join. Or if you're super interested and you want to make sure that I don't forget you, um, do that feedback form and make sure you say, hey, let me know when this number is coming up or where's the registration? Um, I'm so happy that you guys were all able to come and I hope to see you again.